you do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time. Good morning, Grand Rising, to you and whoever you are and wherever you are. Welcome to the May 4th edition of the Counter Races Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. Good show planned for you today. Appreciate your calls. And we thank you for them already. To get in contact with the show, call this number, 516-453-9921. And you can just listen if you'd like. Or if you have a question or even a VGQ, make sure that you press the number one button and you will get in line and your call will be answered accordingly. You can also Gmail me, and we have stacks of Gmails, which I will occasionally uh, read when the time permits. That addresses the numero seven, Mr. Bobby, B O B B Y, at gmail dot com. Chat room is open. There's a few people in there already. Be good. One, PRDZ21, Ash Sankofa is in there. John Raines is in the house today. And there will be a few others in there, usually some interesting uh, chats that are on there before the trolls get on there. And, yes, we do have that. But but the chat room is open. Okay. Now, so we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Fuller, and how are you? Good morning. I'm still learning. Okay. Sound loud and sound clear. By the way, people, all the books are in, and it is my understanding that they are really selling, and Mr. Fuller and I do appreciate that. Word is getting out and spreading around, so we appreciate that. Okay. Let's kick this baby off today. This comes from Diva Tude, Mr. Fuller, and she says, Mr. Fuller, why do people get nervous when you attempt to ask white people counter-racist questions? The reason why I ask is that I came across a black woman who is married to a white male. Both were on the screen, but the black woman was doing all the talking about racism. When I asked the white male if he cared about his black wife, why he doesn't, why doesn't he at least give her a heads up and advise her about the practice of racism, the black woman pulled us to the side and whispered that we should not ask her white husband questions about race, although both we're doing an interview about racism. Mr. Fuller, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you ask more questions. Why? That's one of, that's a very loaded question in court systems, in governments, in anything that has to do with people, in science, in mathematics. Why? Why? And wait for the answer. And then have another question ready if another question is in order. Until all questions are answered. Every question has an answer. Even if the initial answer is I don't know, which is the common answer. Which is expected. In science and mathematics, I don't know. But that's an incentive to do what? According to 
counter racist logic, according to compensatory logic, according to what we might call common logic. The next step is to, since I don't know, and there is a question, every question in the universe that is raised by anybody anywhere, according to logic, you might say common logic, or just plain logic, or whatever you want to call it, is why? And what do I do? Since I don't know, I've got to learn why I don't know, and then come up with the answer to whatever the question is. That's the procedure. That's what you call the codified procedure. That's all you do, just if you can. If you can't do it then, well, you try to make arrangements to do it sometimes in the future. If it's a situation where you, the person says, well, I don't have time to answer all these questions, you know, then you try to find out, well, you came here to talk, so I have a question, so are my question is not answered. Is there, is there any time in the future that I can look for an answer from you? since you are the person presenting yourself as the person who has answers. I guess, if that's the way you are presenting yourself. Hmm. Okay. All righty. Let's uh, do this here. By the way, callers, when you do call in, um, I may have said this, but um, I'll it bears repeating again. Please, when you depress that button, please give the call screen your name so that I can properly introduce you. Thank you. Please, ma'am, please, sir. Mr. Fuller, uh, uh, Divitude also said this. Uh, Mr. Fuller, what would be the reason why non-white people protect the image of white people? Even when a white person is mistreating a non-white person, non-white people will pretend it didn't happen or refuse to talk about it, even make a report against the white person. What is the reason for this? When a person does anything, here again, the question is going to be, that second question, I say the general question, in any situation when there is a question, but the basic question, if you ask about anything, is just what I said a few minutes ago. Why? And you don't move on until you get that answer about why. You don't move to the second question until the first question or the second question or question number 10 or 20 is answered because there will be more confusion down the line if you proceed without an answer to that question. But that is a very, very, very important question in any situation. You have what, then you have why. What's the situation? And then the next logical question is, why do you have this situation? Why do this? Why do that? Why go here? Why go there? Why say this to this person? Why say that to that person? Why is there a difference if there's a difference? If it's, if it's a difference, why do you have that difference? And then, just like I said, and don't move to the next question until that question is answered. Otherwise, you'll have greater confusion and or something worse, which is an argument. Then you have hostility. Once you have an argument, that's likely to lead to hostility. Hostilities usually lead to something that is unhealthy and are incorrect and are not producive of a constructive result. Mm-hmm. All right. There you go, Diva Tude. We got you in the house. Let's go to the phone lines. Go out way out in California. Swa, got you on, brother. Good morning, Grand Rising, and go ahead with your question for Mr. Fuller. 
Um, Grand Rising, Mr. Bobby, Grand Rising, Mr. Nelly Fuller. Um, my question is involving um, Area 7, religion. I wish Nelly Fuller, in your code book, you have um, the religion, eclectic pluralism. Is this a, really, a religion only you can practice, or can anyone choose to practice that religion? Oh, I wouldn't put it in there just for me. Yeah, I, if it was just for me, it wouldn't be in the book. Yeah, it's for everybody to practice if they choose to practice that religion. It's a compensatory religion, yeah, basically more. designed to help a person to find whatever the true religion is, since there are so many religions. There are religions all over the place, and then variations of the same religion. Like, for example, one of the major religions, if not the major, they say Christianity is, uh, there are many varieties of Christianity. Uh, and people will tell you that. And two big divisions, if to the best of what I've been led to understand, is Protestant and Catholic. And uh, the Protestant division uh, segment has many uh, divisions uh, of that segment. And that's what I've been told. I don't know for sure because there's just so much confusion about religion. So eclectic pluralism is basically religion that's designed or intended to help a person who hasn't chosen a religion to choose a religion. And in the meantime, you have to be doing something. So that process is designed to help you find whatever is the true religion out of all of the major religions. It's about six of the major ones, I think. And then there are many, many hundreds, maybe thousands, of what you might call tribal religions. So out of all of those religions, according to the people who have the religions, this is the true religion. So when everybody says this is the true religion, whom are you to believe? And what do you do in the meantime when you're trying to scratch your head and make up your mind? Because, you know, everybody has been the experience of most people when they encounter someone who is very fervent about his or her religion, they say, you better get on board right now. Because you wait, it might be too late. And then they'll explain to you why what the lateness is all about. All right. But, but in answer to the question, eclectic pluralism. Eclectic means choosing from many. And pluralism, these are terms that I put together, just means many. So it's sort of like choosing from many. Out of many, 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 many of this and that and the other, you make a choice. And everybody has to make that choice sometime to another when they are presented a religion that they should be a part of. And then somebody else presents another religion that's different from that religion. Now you got to choose. But it might take you a little time to choose. So during that time, you got to be doing something. So you have a list of things that's in the code book that as a black person, you can be doing while you're trying to make up your mind. Oh, great. All right. Thank you, Swa. Uh, I got your message. Let's go to the 404. That would be Stan in Pennsylvania. Okay, Stan, you are live and you can be heard. Go ahead with your question for Mr. Fuller. Hey, thank you, my sir. Uh, and good morning to you, gentlemen. And um, I had uh, two questions. It, it won't take long. And I'd like to stay on the line as well. And the first question is um, in the family situation. You know, you could be having difficulty with you, you know, your mother, your father, or your sister, and and I don't understand how like black people will say, well, you know, you you only get one mother, or you only get one father, or you know, family is family, and it's almost like this expectation 
that you have to deal with this mistreatment. And I just disagree with that. I mean, if you say you have one biological mother or biological father, that would be correct. But I feel that you could have numerous fathers or numerous mothers, and I don't feel that we should have to put up with mistreatment from anyone. And I have never heard a white person say that before, not saying that we have to base everything that we do off of white people, but I just think that black people say that oftentimes, and I wanted to get your opinion about it, and then I'll ask my second question. The black people say that you have to be loyal or something to... Uh, just, yes, they'll say, they'll say like, well, you know, you can be having problems with your mother. Like your mother could be mistreating you or your father could be very difficult to get along with. And you just make a decision that you don't want to deal with it anymore and, and remove yourself from that situation. And people will make, in the black community, it's like you're the one that's wrong. They'll say, well, you know, you only got one mother or you only have one father. And I just disagree with that. Well, according to the code, in the system of white supremacy, we have illegitimate parents. Every black person on the planet has an illegitimate parent. And those illegitimate parents are racist man and racist woman, the white supremacy. They are our illegitimate parents. They are the only parents that we really have. What we call our parents are just custodians, you might say, in between people, people who have to go to the white supremacists to get instructions, and then they pass over those and pass on those instructions to us in order to survive, because for what we call our mothers and fathers, they are our legitimate parents. But we have been taken over by illegitimate parents, and that includes them, what I call my father. My father came under the illegitimate parent of his, was racist man and racist woman. Once you are conquered, the people who conquer you are your quote-unquote parents. You don't have any other parents. You just got some fellow prisoners. That's who they are. So if you have an argument with them, you're just arguing with a fellow prisoner. That's all. You have any breakdown in communications if you're not getting what you need? Because whatever, if you're black, whatever your so-called parents get that's worth anything, they're going to get it from the white supremacists on this planet, anywhere on this planet. That's where it's going to come from, directly and indirectly. Truth be told. All righty. All right, uh, Stan. So what anybody is your... that mistreats you, mistreatment is mistreatment. Mm-hmm. So you okay. always, you know, get into an environment where you are not mistreated if you best can. That's what that comes down to. The labels don't mean anything. Black people got all kind of labels. Parents. I mean, successful black people. That's a label. And there's no such thing as a successful black person in the system of white supremacy. It simply ain't going to happen. Why? Because he or she is in the system of white supremacy. How can you be successful and be a prisoner of war? That's not oh. success. Mm-hmm. That's impossible. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Stan, yes, uh, there's I, some I background, there's yeah, some background I noise. Uh, I think you might be doing something... Uh, uh, in the background, it's interfering with the transmission of this program. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. sir. It, 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 should, it should be no more noise. I, okay, I apologize now, about your, that. Okay, your second and, question. Um, yes, I agree with what you said because on page 171 and 172, you kind of confirmed that, you know, with you just, remo- you know, you don't have to deal with that. But the second question that I have is very short. Um, you know, in our society, you hear a lot of, um, you know, negativity about black males you know, whether it's the media or whatever, you know, if even in our own community we say negative things about black males. But on your show, it's primarily black males calling in, looking for answers, trying to find a better way. And I just want to know uh, your opinion as to why do you feel or why is it that it's primarily black males that call up to your show. And that, that's all I have to say. And thank you very much for both of you gentlemen and what you do. All right. And stay, I want to stay on the line. I don't know. 
but I would hope that everybody is listening who is classified as non-white anywhere on the planet. I would hope that that would be the case uh, because that's how we got to, we have to have everybody on board, as many people as we can. And the, uh, you might call it a fight or a war, because that's what it is, to replace the system of white supremacy with a system of justice and presumably somewhere as soon as possible produce what this planet called Earth should be populated with when it comes to people, and that is universal man and universal woman, which means creatures who are 100% constructive in everything that they say and do, 24-7. That should be the ultimate goal. Everybody who's on the planet, no matter whom that might be, there will be creatures who always are in a constructive mode, always doing something and saying something that has a constructive result in every area of activity, and enjoying doing so. Somebody might say, well, that sounds like, hey, you're going to squeeze all the enjoyment out of life and whatnot. The things that we enjoy, a whole bunch of them, if you list them, there are things that are non-constructive. And under the system of white supremacy, that's the kind of garbage they put out, the non-white people of the planet confused and in disarray and doing non-constructive things that produce non-constructive results. We no longer should have a world like that and be satisfied with it and call ourselves enjoying it. We should have one that's made up of universal man and universal woman in tune with the very best that the universe has available to us. All righty. All righty. Thank you there, Mr. Fuller. Let's do this here. Let's go, uh, let's see, Duncan asked you this, Mr. Fuller. He says, Mr. Fuller, out of the nine areas of activities, what category would you, would agriculture fall under? And can you give examples of how white supremacy has impacted the food and agriculture industry? Well, according, I can only go according to what I, I keep hearing. And that is, for one thing, in agriculture, a lot of things are produced that shouldn't be produced. Like, for one thing, the proliferation, they're taking farmland and producing tobacco and drugs for example, and always have, as far back as I can remember, produced tobacco, uh, which was a part of the slave trade, a huge part of it, that serves no purpose at all except to produce a non-constructive result. And they say this. They'll say it on television, and they'll say it in schools and whatnot, but they still produce it. I mean, that's criminal. A major crime. Why inhale smoke if that smoke is not going to produce a constructive result where you can always point to the constructive results that inhaling smoke produces? So far, nobody has said that it produces a constructive result. But you take up farmland with this type of nonsense. Huge amounts of farmland. Plow all of that stuff under and produce some broccoli and avocados and spinach and onions and beans and something that's going to nourish the body, not have you somewhere coughing your lungs out and wishing you hadn't started or somewhere being delirious, all these opiates and all these derivatives of something that you either inject or smoke. We don't need to produce any of that if it's going to produce what? Constructive results. And so you just say it. That's what you do about it because codification is all about what you do. 
So if you're going to say something about what to do, just say that and keep saying it. Stop producing stuff that doesn't produce anything that's going to have a non-constructive result. Stop producing it, period. Don't use agriculture, what little land we got that's left, because I understand that, you know, there's less and less farmland. And that that is a huge portion of that that is used is being misused here on this planet, everywhere. So stop producing stuff that shouldn't be produced. And just keep saying it until maybe it catches on, hopefully. But that's the best we can do as prisoners of war. Because the white supremacists, under the system of white supremacy, they'll say, hey, (laughs) I produce what I want to produce. (laughs) You're my prisoner. You're going to get out there and produce it. If you want to eat, I'll bring people across borders and all like that to produce all kinds of stuff. If they take it, that's going to be harmful to them. They ain't going to be able to produce nothing. And then they're going to be running around acting crazy, and I'm going to shoot them. The same people that were uh, hired to produce stuff. They're going to be all on the stuff that I got them growing. And just like in the case of a young fellow, I think, in Baltimore, who was on the list of people who were shot by the law enforcement officers, he was on the street selling some type of tobacco, I think. Yes, cigarettes. Yes, and he died as a result of it in a chokehold. Now, the tobacco didn't have a chokehold on him, which still tobacco will, if you keep using amounts of it, I've been told. I, I, I never use it. I mean, you know, I never, you know, I learned at an early age that, uh, well, smoking is something I need to pass up on. And I, I did that with another product they produce, and that is alcohol which you find plenty of wherever there are non-white people that you drink. Not alcohol that you rub on your skin or something to heal or something, but alcohol that you drink. It shouldn't be producing alcohol that you drink. Why? Because it produces a non-constructive result. And I saw so much of it when I was very, very young myself. I don't, I don't know what the stuff tastes like. I have never tasted a drop of alcohol in my entire existence. And that's not bragging or anything like that. It's just that it scared me. Because I saw, I was around falling down drunks. And I saw a young, at a, as a, at a very young age, I saw a fellow, very nice fellow, but he drank all the time. He was very mannerable, uh, got along with everybody. He didn't fight or fuss, which is something that alcohol makes a lot of people do. But he would get drunk and stay drunk for a long time and then get drunk again. And one day I saw him staggering down the street, and he fell. He stumbled first into a pile of broken glass. Blood Blood went everywhere. And that that convinced me. I'd seen enough already. But when I saw that, I said, no way. No way is anybody going to put that poison in my body if it makes me do that. That is a very non-constructive result. <laughs> okay. All righty. Let's take a break here. You are listening to... The Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. And we thank you for uh, doing that. If you'd like to get in contact with the show, make sure that you call 516 453 9921 and be sure to depress the number one button so that you can be heard. You can give a question or VGQ. And, and please, ma'am, please, sir, make your questions concise and to the point and in a question form so that Mr. Fuller can answer your question. 
I know some people might want to add a little background to it, but just ask your question as simply as you can so that we can, um, so Mr. Fuller can answer that and we can get to uh, more questions. You can also Gmail me at the numero 7, Mr. Bobby, B O B B Y, at gmail.com. And at some point, not today though, but at some point, your Gmail will be read and I usually will give you the date and time. Uh, on, on a particular program that your Gmail will be read. You can also go into the chat room, and there's some interesting conversations that are going on in the chat room. You you, you can also uh, view that. Books are in, and Mr. Fuller will be speaking about that in about 15 or 20 minutes, so make sure that you hear that. We'd like to thank you in advance, for, for first of all, for calling in and listening. But also for we were Mr. Fuller and I were told this morning that uh, books are I think the term was flying off of the shelves, and that's good. That's real good. Read them, and Mr. Fuller will have more to say about the, about that in um, about twenty minutes. Okay, let's go back to the phone lines, and this is a brother from last week. He did it good. Let's go to see if I can get him in here. Let's go to Harlem. And we're going to talk about Joe. Joe, you're on with Mr. Fuller. You can't be heard. Thank you, brother. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, so last week, uh, Cola had called in and mentioned about choice. And you kind of just mentioned about a decision, a choice about not drinking alcohol. So that's my question. Um, is our ability to choose or decide or make decisions, is it limited? Is a what now? Our choice. Our ability to choose, is it limited? Do you have a limited uh, ability, ability to ability choose? To choose? Yeah. Well, it depends on circumstances. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes you are forced to do things, uh, the white supremacists. But when you do have a choice in anything, choosing what road you're going to take, uh, what, or what, which direction you're going to go in, uh, what your uh, choices when you're given choices between occupations, ways to make money, uh, what your choice is going to be. If you have any choices, most black people don't. <laughs> we're told what we're going to do in any given place and time. But when you do have choices, just make the most constructive choice. That's the compensatory way. That's the codified way. If you just have about have five choices... Way. Uh, you know, you look at, you know, go over each five, see what the ingredients are in each one of them, and say, now, which is the most constructive choice out of these five? Or it might be just I two. Do. Or it might be 200. If you're fortunate, got 200 choices, I mean, you can go through each one, take your time, comb through it, See what's the most constructive that you think that you might be engaged in, and go for it all the way. All right. uh, I have a follow-up to, uh, question. Um, is our is our ability to choose, or uh, could it be manipulated or dictated by a racist man and racist woman? Always, always. <laughs> they 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 are the ones who decide what choices we can make. We can't make any choices on. <clears throat> on our own, without their approval. We are their prisoners of war. Recently, I've been trying to emphasize that over and over again because I'm trying to get people to say it that way, to talk about it that way, in school, in colleges, whatnot. Black people are prisoners of war. No truce has ever been declared since war was declared on us. No treaties have ever been made that were worth anything, and certainly no end of the war has ever been declared and backed up by things that are written on paper and backed up by the action that goes with it. It's, nobody can point to one. We were in captivity. The white supremacists admit that. I captured you people. I conquered you people. They brag about it in their history books up until recently. They're trying to backtrack now and act like it didn't happen, but that's too late. 
Okay, in all the schools now you have this controversy I understand about what's going to be taught about history. That it might make some white people uneasy in a classroom to start talking about black people put into captivity in the system of white supremacy. They say that it all ended in 1865. It did not. That was just some scraps of paper that said that. The war has not ended. Why? Because you still have the system of white supremacy worldwide. So all these little dots and dashes that they put in history books about this is the cutoff point. It hasn't been a cutoff point. We're still prisoners of war. Every black person is a veteran. If anybody asks, do we have any veterans in this college class or whatnot? All the veterans hold up your hands. Everybody black in there, male and female and everybody. Just hold up their hands. Oh, you're a veteran. Veteran of what? Korean War, Vietnam, uh, uh, Afghanistan? They no. <laughs> I'm a veteran of the war between those who believe in white supremacy and those who don't. And I am in captivity in a prison of war still, as I sit here in this classroom. Sir, ma'am, since you asked. <laughs> All righty. Thank you, Joe from the Bronx. Um, don't be a stranger. Mr. Fuller, I have a question here. I'm not going to give this person's name, but um, let me read it. He says, Mr. Fuller, I do not identify as a male or female. Can I attempt to be a, quote, universal person, end of quote, without a gender? Can I try to end the system of white supremacy even without accepting a gender identification and instead be a, quote, universal person? Thank you. Well, the goal, according to the code, should be that everybody should be universal man with, for, and alongside, or however you want to picture it, universal woman. And that would mean a female, male with female. But wherever you are, none of us are what we should be. Even us who are what you call the alpha males, uh, that's the name that somebody else gave it, and uh, with a female. We're still not the quality of people we should be. None of us are. You're, you're a victim of white supremacy, you're a mess. I don't care what kind of status you have or what your gender is or whatnot. You are a mess. Why? Because you're a victim of white supremacy, and that's what they make of every black person. So you can't expect black person to behave in any kind of way that makes sense. When we do, that's a bonus, you might say, in the system of white supremacy. That's a phenomenon because we're not supposed to make sense Anytime in anything, except when they force us to make sense for their benefit. That's the system of white supremacy. So it's not nothing you apologize for, but according to the code, all people should be trying to strive to be universal man and universal woman. Why? With universal woman. Why? Because that would be the best arrangement. But nobody including white people, have the best arrangements of any kind between people because in the system of white supremacy, all arrangements are bogus, including white people with other white people. They don't have the type of arrangement they should have. I mean, the whole thing is poisonous. Everything about the system of white supremacy when it comes to people is poisonous. Everything, when it comes to people, people relationships are shambles in the system of white supremacy. Now, what is it about white supremacy that is so, you might say, attractive? It is super successful when it comes to handling things. 
the system of white supremacy, according to the evidence, is the most successful operation in the manipulation of things in the universe, in the making of things, in inventions, et cetera, et cetera, in recorded history. And that doesn't say that it's the type of system that should exist. But it, it is the most successful when it comes to things. When it comes to getting things done that need doing, along with a lot of things that don't need doing. But it's still the most successful system ever thought up in the minds of people in recorded history. But when it comes to interaction between people, it's a complete failure. I mean a horrendous failure because it's based on the mistreatment of people deliberately. The system of white supremacy is designed to mistreat people in every area of activity if those people particularly are of color. They're supposed to get the worst of the system of white supremacy. That's what it's designed for. Supposed to deliberately receive the worst of treatment of people. That's why it should be replaced with what? Something better. And that would be a system of what? Theoretically, something that's never been done by anybody in recorded history, and that's a system of justice, which means what? Guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most always gets the most constructive help. That would be what would take to have universal man and universal woman inclusively. So in answer to the question, regardless of your so-called gender, the white supremacists, you know, they don't care nothing about gender. They don't care about anything involving people except being destructive. And they love destroying people. That's why they glorify everything that's murderous. Crazy about guns and swords. Even when they strut across the stage with uh, the movie awards, they got a thing called an Oscar. Oscar's carrying a sword. Oscar doesn't have on a stitch of clothes, but got a sword. Right in front of the phallus, if it's a male, I think. I don't know whether it's male or female. But he's got a sword. Out of all the things to have, a sword? And you're presenting the best movies? What's the sword for? But see, in the white supremacist's mind, something that's going to destroy is paramount in the white supremacist culture. You build up things to destroy them. Put up a building and then knock it down, destroy it, rather than let somebody live in it, at least for a day or two, I mean, until they can find a better place. Board up a building, and people right up under the boarded-up building on the sidewalk. That shows what they care about people. The most powerful and smartest people on earth, the white supremacists. But this is what they care about people. That's why it's got to be replaced, the entire system, with a system of justice. Oh, okay. it's kind of long-winded answer, but I hope that it encapsulated uh, your answer. Uh huh. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Mm-hmm. Um, for those who uh, I've been communicating with um, on your Gmails, um, I may have accidentally put uh, on one, the response May fourth, nineteen seventy, and that is not what I. Um, want to do May 4th, 2021. May 4th, 1970 was, uh, it was on my mind today, uh, was when the Ohio National Guard killed four students at Kent State University, May 4th, 1970. They were protesting the Vietnam War, and that was on my mind this morning. Um, but um, in case you didn't know, that ha- that did happen. Um, but um, 
something else happened too, not that day. Uh, the Jackson State University uh, killings occurred on Friday, May the 15th, 1970. It was called Jackson College then, now Jackson State University, where Deion Sanders is now the head football coach. On May the 14th, 1970, city and state police confronted a group of black students. Shortly after midnight, the police opened fire, killing two students and injuring 12. The event happened only 11 days after the Kent State shootings, in which the National Guardsmen killed four students at Kent State University in Ohio, which had the first, which had first captured national attention, violence. But anyway, my apologies if I did put May 4th, 1970, on my response to your Gmails. Mr. Fuller, this is the time, and you've been missing it all throughout this program, but this is the time that we set aside for you to talk about that wonderful book, How We Can Get It. So take yes, it away, you Mr. Go, Fuller. Yes, sir. You go to ProduceJustice.com, ProduceJustice.com, and there's a textbook called The Compensatory Counter-Racist Code. It has a longer basic title, but that's explained in the textbook itself. The revised expanded edition, and also the first edition, uh, and, and it's uh, the publishable form, I like to call it. That's the 1984 edition for those who like that. But I uh, recommend the revised expanded edition because it takes in everything that's in the original 1984 edition. And it's called a Compensatory Counter-Racist Code, a textbook, workbook for thought, for speech, and or action for victims of white supremacy. Now, if you're not a victim of white supremacy or consider yourself as being a victim of white supremacy, then maybe the book is not for you. But if you consider yourself a victim, you can take it into a college classroom or anywhere, and you can just turn to any page and make statements out of the book and, you know, and see what the professor says, white or non-white, whomever the professor is, if you're talking about race or racism, once the subject comes up. In fact, you only use the book and involve other people when other people are willing to talk about race and let you know that, not because that's the best way. That's in the book itself. It's a book of instructions about how to interact with people if you're a person of color, with white people and with non-white people, in order to do what? In order to get the most constructive result, because we're not in a constructive world. In the system of white supremacy, constructive results between people are not to be expected. No matter how many marches we have and all like that, don't expect constructive results because the system of white supremacy is not designed to produce constructive results between people. I mean, particularly white and non-white. It's designed to produce animosity, hostility, death, destruction of all kinds, with the non-white categories getting the worst of everything in every area of activity. So the book is, itself is segmented into the nine areas of activity, what I call the nine major areas. There are thousands of areas of activity, I guess, among people. But I say economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And the book is designed to help a person to... Uh, to guide a person, an individual victim of white supremacy, in what to say and what not to say. And some and a lot of thoughts. You think before you speak. And then the action part. What to do and what not to do. In all of these nine areas of activity. Just some suggestions. And a lot of it has to do with questions that you ask. Why? Because... All problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. That, too, is in the book. But it's a basic guide for people who are kind of frustrated with the whole racial thing, and it's a basic guide 
as a premier, you might say, elementary school to start with in solving the problem, not just talking about the problem, but in solving the problem. And I think that what I call the compensatory code, code just means something that works. I think that the book will help whomever reads it to weave their way through this confusion that the white supremacists have put out here and to do it in a way that will always work for you, not against you. But you can go, go get the book by going to ProduceJustice.com, ProduceJustice.com. And while I'm on that subject, there's a book put out by Kahari and Aharo of Columbus, Ohio, some years ago called A Race Code War. Now, I glanced through the book uh, just uh, this morning. And I uh, looked at a few things. Again, I've never read the book from front to back. I've just glanced at it really down through the years. And I I think it's a, it's a book that's called A Race Code War by Kahari Inaharo. And also he's a Radio 1 Straight Talk Live out of Columbus, Ohio. And you might take a look at that book, too, if you're interested in uh, books that will cause you to think about what to do about racism. And I think there's enough thoughts in there, I mean, for people to take a look at the book. I think he has another one out about sex. And everybody's interested in sex one way or another. And uh, I just want to put that in there, too. That's Kahari Inaharo is the author's name. Race Code War is the name of the book. But for my book and the word guy that goes with it, go to ProduceJustice.com. That's ProduceJustice.com. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Okay. 516-453-9921. Let's go out to California and... Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Whoops. Yes. Yes, let's go out to California, Long Beach. Uh, let's see, Mark, Marquis, you are now on Mr. Fuller, and you can be heard. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. I'm still learning. Good morning, um, sir. My question uh, for today pertains on pages 28 through 30 of the revised expanded edition of the Cold Book. Um, in regards to racial showcasing and confusion through illusion. So last week I heard um, Representative Jim Clyburn say uh, the concept of America is not racist. The Vice President Kamala Harris say the concept of America is not racist. And also U.S. Senator Tim Scott said the same exact sentence saying America is not racist. So my question is, by them saying that, and according to counter racist logic, could it be said that those three individuals are being racially showcased and then saying the country is not racist through the confusion of illusion? It could be said. That could be said. But the recommendation, according to the code, is what? When a non-white person says anything about race, racism, and or counter-racism, according mm-hmm. to the code, they have VGQ. And right. my response is supposed to be, VGQ means they have victims guaranteed qualification. They are qualified to say those things. Why? As victims. Each victim of racism is qualified to say anything that he or she chooses to say as a prisoner of war about his or her victimization, no matter how it sounds to another person when they say it. And so they are totally qualified to say these things. So when I'm asked about what Mr. Clyburn said about race, racism, and our counter-racism, or Mr. Tim Scott, or anybody else who's classified as non-white, all I can say is, according to the code, he said what he said. If it's the case of a female, 
she said what she said. And that's all that I'm qualified to say because they are qualified under VGQ, Victims Guaranteed Qualification, to say what they said. Now, if you ask me about the issue, if you ask me about is America a racist country, I'm just going to give this as an example according to the code. If someone asks me, is is America a racist country? My answer is no. But immediately, I got to qualify that answer. And how do I qualify it so that the person doesn't get what? Confused? Because I'm not supposed to be spreading confusion. But Neely Fuller officially is saying America is not a racist country. I'm saying that right now. America is not a racist country. Why? Because America doesn't exist. That's why. How can something that doesn't exist be racist or be a country if it doesn't exist? America is a concept like Africa is a concept. This is in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. You'll see it there if you go. Uh, I don't know what page it's on, but this is this this is presented in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. And Asia doesn't exist. Why? Because what is an American? That's the first thing you ask. What is an American? Or what is America? America is not a racist country. Well, what is it? See, that's the, you start raising questions. You don't start saying what it is. You raise the question to the person that's using the term. What is America? Get that straight first. What's the definition of America? What's the definition of America? What's the definition of Africa? What's the definition of Asia? Well, the compensatory code says Asia, America, and Africa all have the same definition, compensatory definition. These are definitions that Neely Fuller made up. They all have the same definition. They're not places. That's number one. America is not a place. Asia is not a place. And Africa is not a place. Well, what is Africa and Asia and America? They are people. What kind of people? People who practice justice. And you don't find anybody on the planet who practices justice. Why? Because the system of white supremacy is the dominant government on the planet, and it's impossible to have justice and the system of white supremacy on the same planet at the same time. According to what? Well, according to compensatory logic, counter-racist logic, and according to any kind of common logic, if you ask enough questions, starting with, what's the definition of America? Is even let's, let's just, See, we, we keep using that term, America, in association with white supremacy. It's no, it's no connection at all. White supremacy is real. Racism is real. America is not. That's a concept. That's something that everybody should want to be. Why should you want to be an American and an African and an Asian? Because they're all the same thing. What's an American and what's an African and what's an Asian if they're worth being these things at all? First of all, they have to be people who practice justice. And since nobody practices justice, in the system of white supremacy, that's impossible, then these places, these people don't exist. These are just labels. That's why you have, you say, you got an American flag. The flag don't know nothing about that. You got an American eagle. What does the eagle know about being an American? The eagle ain't got no idea about the Constitution or nothing else. And ain't got no borders. The eagle just crosses borders. I mean, you know, like, hey, I don't know. <laughs> Y'all talking about I'm in America? I'm, yeah, what, what does that mean to me? I'm looking for a rabbit. 
Mr. Fuller, hold that thought, please. We have to take a station break. Hold that thought, and we'll come right back to it. Hang on there. Thank you for all those who have listened to the first hour of the Counter Racist Code show, also called the CRCS. We thank you if you have to go. We thank you for all your calls and your uh, Gmails and the conversations that you have. So we'll see you next week. But for those who are going to stay on and stay on the line, we have the second hour of the Counter Racist Code show with Mr. Yelly Fuller, which will con. <laughs> which will convene here in about five seconds. All righty, welcome back to the second hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. If you'd like to get in contact with the show, and we would love for you to do that, simply call 516-453-9921. And make sure that you depress the number one button so that you can get in line. We would ask, please, ma'am, please, sir, that you would make your questions concise to the point. You, you really don't need to go into a, a long explanation. Just ask your question so Mr. Fuller can answer it, and we can get on with it. Please do that, ma'am. Please do that, sir. Also, you can Gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, at gmail.com. It will not be read today, but it will go in rotation, and I will try to read it as we uh, go along in other programs. Chat room is is open. Very good conversations in there. You may want to check that out. You can do that also. All righty. And oh, by the way, all the books are in. And all you have to do is go to producejustice.com and get the uh, materials uh, that are that will be discussed on this program. Okay, 516-453-9921, the number. Make sure you give them your name, and we'll get on with it. Okay, Mr. Fuller, back to that. America is not um, is a concept. You want to finish that up so we can move on, please, sir? Well, I just want to say the concept, the root concept, and the top concept, and the only sensible and logical concept that the word America has, or American, you have to be a person to be an American. That's number one. It's not a place. Otherwise, you couldn't keep adding on to it. And you couldn't call places like, you know, you say people are coming across the border. They're coming to America. Coming across the border from where? And you say, well, from Venezuela. Well, somebody told me Venezuela is called South America. So they're just moving from south to north. That's all. Like moving from one room to another in your own house. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. That's the most logical way of looking at it. Coming to America, they're already in America. That's what, if you say Venezuela is South America, you open a, a, a geography book, that's, that's what you will see. South America in big bold letters. So how could these people be coming to America? But we use that term all the time. See, it doesn't exist. And when you look at it for what it really is, it's a concept. It's a concept for producing a product called justice. And it never has produced that. Nobody has ever produced justice in recorded history. Why? Because of the definition, the compensatory definition. I'm not talking about the dictionary definition. I'm talking about the definition in the book for victims of white supremacy that I wrote. It's the best definition. I don't think anybody will ever come up with one that's better. And if they do, I'll adopt it. Because the code requires me to adopt the best of everything. That's the the compensatory, constructive way. So what's the definition of justice again? Justice is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most always gets the most constructive help. These are supposed to be the guarantees in order to have a thing called justice. It's never been done by anybody in recorded history. So 
you don't have any Americans yet. Everybody should want to be one. You don't have any Africans yet because Africans have to produce justice in order to qualify for the title of African. And you don't find justice nowhere in the place that they call Africa among the people that they call Africans. You don't find justice. You ain't going to find it nowhere. And you ain't going to find it among people who are called Asians. Not nowhere. Nowhere. And there's supposed to be a whole lot of people who are called Asians. Some people included as Asians sometimes under the system of white supremacy. And sometimes the people who are called Asians are not included as Asians, particularly when you start talking about the so-called Middle East, which is another misnomer. What is the Middle East if it keeps changing? Sometimes some places are included in the Middle East and sometimes included in Africa. Take, for instance, you'll say Egypt, the land of the pyramids, and you'll say that's a part of the Middle East. And you look at a map, and they say, it looks like it's in Africa. Well, wait a minute. Who's saying this? The white supremacists. Because they slice up all kinds of stuff, you know, on a piece of paper, and say, this is this, and this is that, just like they go all over the world, naming whatever they want to name, and slapping whatever title they want to slap on, whatever it is, to suit what? The system of white supremacy. That's what. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Marky, for your call, and do not be a stranger. Let's continue out in California and be good one. You are on with Mr. Fuller, and you can be heard. Grand Rising. Grand yes, Rising. sir. Yes, sir. Grand right, Rising. So, sir. Um, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, everywhere I go, I most places, uh, Black males and black females consider themselves um, men and women. Can you re- reiterate your answer a little bit? What a, uh, a man and woman is, because uh, a lot of us seem to um, misdefine that. Well, if I understand the question, I'm just saying you can't be a man under the system of white supremacy, and you're just a female until you become a woman. And a woman is related to a man. So uh, a woman can't, uh, a female can't become a woman until she's interactive with a man. They call her a woman, okay? She's the womb of man. So there's a relationship there. You're just a male and a female when you're born, and they say you come into manhood in the Northwestern Hemisphere, in most places, at age 21, sometimes 18, would not. But these are just uh, markings on what you might call a calendar. But for non-white people, for black people, in the system of white supremacy, if you're a male, you can never be a man. You can be a boy, or you can be an imitation female. But you can never be a man. Why? Because the white supremacists say it ain't but one man. That's why we say, here come the man. That goes way back. You don't hear that expression very much nowadays. But when I was coming along in the early days, back in the 1930s and 40s, when somebody said, here come the man, they meant what? White man. That's because that's the only man. We're just boys. Hey, boy. You know, Sometimes we call that now, and we resent it. But that's an accurate designation. Why? Boys are dependent on men. And when you're a prisoner of war, you remain a boy. Any prisoner of war, I don't care how old they are, is a boy. Why? He's in a boy's status. And the female remains a female if she's not connected with a man. She can't, she can't become a woman. She cannot become a woman. She's a woman with a man, one way or another, directly, indirectly. And they work together. But she can't become, uh, so she becomes, black females 
are forced to become imitation men in the year 2021 that we have now. All over the world, they're being masculinized. And, and, and uh, the white supremacists, apparently, according to the evidence, seem to be planning on taking the black female and eventually make them the ultimate soldiers and pair them off with other females since they are forced to be given up on the black male ever becoming a man because too many of them going are becoming imitation females. And the rest of them are going to have a foot on their neck. All right? And all the masculinity squeezed out of them on somebody's knee or somebody's gun or something until they become permanent boys and are imitation females, artificial females, whatever you want to call it. And this is the white supremacist plan for the non-white people of the entire planet so that they can remain in power forever because males and females among black people, people of color, will be in complete disarray and in mass confusion about everything, particularly not only the color of their skin, but in everything in every area of activity, particularly massive confusion in sexuality. Because when you have confusion in sexuality, you don't have to confuse a person in anything else. You can jerk them around any kind of way, in any way you want to take them. The white supremacists understand that. Why? Sex and sexual motivation is the most powerful motivating factor among the people of planet Earth next to the system of white supremacy itself. Going back to biblical times and before, as long as there's been people, there's sexual motivation. So the white supremacists look at that eighth area of activity, as it is called in the textbook for victims of white supremacy, and they say, if we can confuse the non-white people of this planet sexually, comes up with all kinds of confusion. It's everything that you can think of to confuse them so that they can't even recognize what sex is. We can confuse them in everything else very easily because sex is a very powerful force. And if you can get that harness under your tutelage permanently in the field of economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, you can jerk them around in war, any kind of way you want to. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Be good, one. Thank you for your your call, and uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, this is VGQ from, and I do have her permission to use her name, Jay, uh, Jane Lance. Uh, Mr. Fuller, this is about global radiation poisoning. She says since uh, March of 2011, radiation has been leaking into the Pacific Ocean as a result of the Fukushima disaster in Japan. Because everything is connected, all of the Earth's oceans will eventually be contaminated. The mainstream media is ignoring this crisis, and CMOS is being heavily marketed to people of color. CMOS is being peddled into supplement form in cosmetics like foundation and hair gel and even children's gummy bears. I urge all listeners to stop consuming seafood, especially sea moss, seaweed, catfish, and shellfish. Fukushima radiation is an extinction, extinction level event. It is responsible for the rise in cancers, the orange tritinium skies during last year's 
wildfires in California, mass marine life die-offs like the sea lions and whales washing up on the shore in Monterey, California, and the increase in sea temperatures melting the polar ice caps that are being blamed on the sun slash global warming. Thank you all for listening, and please share this information with your loved ones. This is uh, from Jane Lance, and I've heard about the Fukushima uh, radiation explosion. Have you heard about that, Mr. Fuller? No, I haven't, but in the system of white supremacy, poison of all kinds is everywhere. They they, they are spreading it uh, everywhere particularly where we'll have non-constructive results among whom? People of color. Always. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the Bronx. Jacob, Jacob, you are in the house and you can be heard. Go ahead, Jacob. Good morning, Mr. Bob. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. I... I uh, yesterday I had a uh, heated debate which developed into an argument with my younger sister who was visiting the Bronx from college. Now we were arguing about a topic called intersectionality, which is a, uh, in my opinion, a white liberal um, introduced ideology uh, based on the assumption that depending on uh, your identification in society, you could be oppressed in different. Um, by in different ways. For example, if I'm a black trans person, I could be oppressed based on transphobia and homophobia. I could be oppressed based on the fact that I'm black, and I could be oppressed based on the fact that I'm technically a woman. So sexism. Now, um, there's an underlying assumption that all of these different forms of oppression that is impacting um, individual differently are all equal. They're all faced at equal intensities. And I was trying to tell her that under the system of white supremacy, that's the greatest injustice. And different injustices faced by people, um, I, I can't deny that as a woman you're, you're impacted differently as a man, but under white supremacy, your race um, matters the most. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter that uh, you, you're afraid to walk home um, alone as a woman, just like a white woman. It doesn't mean that you should identify with white women based on that fact alone. They have, they have a privilege that you don't have that is greater than your uh, female status, which is them being white. Um, now, we developed into an argument based on um, this ideology, and this is uh, something that's being widespread in uh, academia and white liberal circles to non-white people in the 21st century. And I want to know uh, what is the effect of counter-racist logic to intersectionality, and if and were my points uh, uh, correct in according to your counter-racist logic. And uh, if you have time, could you speak on the legalization of marijuana um, in states? Um, and how it okay, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're asking too many questions at the same time. Let me answer a question at one question at a time, please, sir. Okay, yeah, what's that first question? question. Yeah, well, now just repeat just your first question real, real short, so he can answer the question, please, so, sir. So, so we are arguing about intersectionality, which is basically you could be oppressed um, according to uh, what. Yes, yeah, but what is the question? Oh, what is the effect of counter racist logic toward to to, to, the, to the ideology? Because it's something that was that's been introduced to non white people um in academia and white liberal circles um by the white supremacists. To what what is the what? The effect. I want to know what is the effect of counter racist uh logic um when confronted by um intersectionality theory. Confronted by who? Intersectionality, the idea of intersectionality. I was debating with my sister about the What's that word? Idea intersectionality? Inter, intersectionality. Intersect. What does that mean? Based on what I based on what I identify as. I'm a black I'm a black woman. I'm oppressed based on the fact that I'm black and the and the fact that I'm a woman. Now I could identify with white women based on that fact that I'm oppressed in different ways. At the same time, and there's the assumption that I'm oppressed 
with the equal intensity. So um, sexism is just as bad as racism. Homophobia is just as bad as racism. That's basically what uh, he's, he's trying okay, to say. Okay, wait a minute. No, you see, you see, I'm trying to get the, the core of your question. What is so, the effect of you know, racism? We might have logic. a problem here, so it's all about problem solving. So I'm trying to get to the actual core of what the problem is. The problem is is that non-white people um, who believe in intersectionality think that based on what they identify as, if I'm a woman, I identify as a woman. If I'm a, if I'm a gay person, I identify as a gay person, that their identity as a woman and a gay person is equal to the fact um, that they experience racism. So sexism and homophobia is just as bad as racism, according to these people who believe in intersectionality. Okay, so the question is what now? What is the effective counter-racist logic that I should um, express to people, or what is the effective counter-racist solution to the idea of intersectionality under the system of white supremacy? Well, I guess if I I understand the, the question of whatever the problem is, Racism is the dominant factor in anything that involves a white person with a non-white person. Racism is the dominant factor on the entire planet any time of night or day, regardless of what the person's category is in anything else, whether the person is a so-called executive or the person is a transgender or the person's or working on a project together, both white and non-white, the dominant factor is the system of white supremacy. Always, always, without fail. If it involves anything that has to do with a white person and a non-white person, the dominant factor in that so-called interaction, whatever it is, is the system of white supremacy itself. And the white person is in a supreme position. Why? Because the white person, not their fault, if you can call it a fault, they are born into the system of white supremacy. They are born into the prison master class. That's a category. They had nothing to do with that. But they are born in that system. So they have to actively dismantle the system themselves if they have the correct intentions, or they go along with the systems they are born in. Now, that's a choice that each white person has to make. And so if, if I hope that answers the question. In every uh, thing, not just in the area of sex, but in every area of activity, economics, education, labor, law, the dominant factor, the dominant influence, is white supremacy. That's the dominant influence in everything sexual. Any kind of sexual interaction between people on the planet, the dominant is going to be, and the result is going to be, something that the white supremacists approve of. Otherwise, they're going to evaporate it. Okay. that That includes the... Uh, interaction between black males and black females. We're not going to get that ever the way it ought to be in the system of white supremacy. I don't care how hard you try. Some people will say, well, I have a personal relationship with my mate. No, you don't, because you're both prisoners of war. That's an illusion. You say, well, I'm a male, and she's female, and, I mean, you know, we get along perfectly. I mean, we don't argue, we don't fuss, we don't fight. We interact with each other in a constructive manner. I mean, we raise our children that way and whatnot. You're still in the system of white supremacy, sir. And it's not the type of situation you should be in with you and your brood. We don't have a situation that's the type of situation that should exist. Nowhere on the planet. What is your second question, Jacob? If you have time, um, I see that the trend is going um, an increasing amount of states in the country. Most recently, New York has legalized marijuana. Um, 
What do you think, what is your opinion about the legal, the eventual legalization of marijuana nationwide in the United States of America and how non-white people should approach it? I don't know enough about it, but I do know one thing, what questions they ask according to the code, and that is, is it going to produce a constructive result or a non-constructive result? And if it's going to produce a constructive result, how? Show me the evidence of the constructive result. If I use what you call medical marijuana, is it going to cure cancer? Is it going to cure this? Show me something that it cures. I haven't heard that yet. They say, well, it cures an anxiety. Well, for how long? Whatever that is. What is an anxiety? What What do you do when you are in a state of an anxiety? And does it damage anything else while it's curing one thing? I see all kinds of things on television every day that say, oh, take this particular pill, this one pill right after another. You see it every day on television. I mean, the pills with names that you can't pronounce. And then they give you a whole bunch of other names that you can't pronounce as side effects. And boy, the side effects, they'll say, now, this will cure your headache. But the side effect is it will kill your kidneys and your liver, and you'll have heart disease in the process. But your headache is gone. Hmm. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, producers, I'm going to take a station break here. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Now, to get in contact with the show, all you have to do is call 516-453-9921, and that will get you in contact with the show. I would ask, please, ma'am, please, sir, that when you ask Mr. Fuller a question, please make, please, ma'am, please, sir, please make your question concise so that Mr. Fuller can understand what you are saying to get uh, the answer that you desire. If you tell a story uh, trying to illustrate your point, it, it can it can be confusing, and I'm getting a lot of uh uh, there's a lot of chatter on the um, on the in, in the chat room about that. So please, ma'am, please, sir, for our listeners, when you do that, just just ask, just just ask your question, be concise with it, and not long. If you email me, do the same thing. Do not write me a novel. Just just make it concise so that I can ask Mr. Fuller. You can get. The desired answer. And that is all because we are under a time constraint. So it's important that uh, you ask the question and that Mr. Fuller can answer the question and get as many in as we possibly can. Can you do that, please, ma'am? Can you do that, please, sir? Really appreciate that. Okay. Let's go here. Thank you, Emery. Lamumba, thank you very much. Brightness, we thank you and all the people that are in the uh, chat room. Let's go to Victor from uh, Canada. Victor, you're now on with Mr. Fuller and Nathan from Spain. We're going to try to get you in here, too. Victor, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question, please, sir? Oh, hi, Mr. Bobby. Hi, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. Um, Good morning. Yes, Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Fuller, I think I heard you say before that we're not supposed to be striving for self-esteem and that we get self-esteem through our constructive results. Um, Can you explain why we're not supposed to be focusing on self-esteem and more on constructive results? To the best of my recollection, I never used the term self-esteem. I don't think it's in anywhere in in one of the publications, and I don't think I've ever mentioned it on there. I've mentioned respect. 
I mentioned apologies, and I mentioned love as three things that you never asked for. And I said that black people shouldn't have, if you say self-esteem within the context of pride, I say black people don't have anything to be proud of. We're prisoners of war. We were born prisoners of war. We never had the opportunity to do anything to be proud of. We can be proud if we have a need for it at all, and I say we shouldn't. You know, be proud for what? We're just doing what we're supposed to do when we produce a thing called justice. I mean, that's supposed to be routine, right out of the gate. That's not supposed to be anything that we're striving to get, but the white supremacists has seen to it that we are born into a system of non-justice. That should have been taken for granted for everybody on the planet. The minute they were born and before they were born, justice should have been prevailing when we got here. Everybody who's on the planet now. But everybody talks about it. Oh, man, do we give lip service to that word justice without even giving it a definition? Look in the dictionary and you see what? Justice is fair play. Fair means white. What kind of definition is that? We have to think about words. That's why I have a word guide uh, that you can get by going to producejustice.com. It's a pretty thick book, but hopefully it's some guide toward how to use words. And in the earlier part of the program, I also mentioned a race code book uh, called uh, The Race, race code, code War, War the name of the book. Right, by yeah. R. N. Aharo, mm-hmm. and I glanced through that. And that's a person I've been associated with for some years and was once on his program for many years. And uh, he wrote a book, uh, hopefully, could be, probably would say so, think it's a reference to it, uh, kind of based on some of the ideas that I had. And uh, and I just glanced through his book. I've never read it, but you can get that book called A Race Cold War by Kahari and Haro. But we should all be trying to come up with codes because I don't have a monopoly on a code. A code is anything that works in your behalf. Like I don't have it in the book, but I have three things that I've added on this program about being pulled over. And I do these three things. You, you, before you declare a code, for the most part, you try to run a test on it so you know it works or work to the best of whatever's available to you. But if you get pulled over, don't fuss, don't fight, don't flee. I don't care who you are if you're a person of color. And some people have said, and they're telling the truth, well, you might get shot anyway, and you're not doing any of those things. You're not fussing, you're not fighting, and you're not running away. But they kill you anyhow. I say, well, as a prisoner of war, you should expect that. We got to get that in our heads. We are prisoners of war. We should expect to be killed by anybody at any time in the system of white supremacy. Why? Because it's authorized. That's something you do with a black person. If you feel like it, kill him. Kill her. Kill him. And keep doing it. And anything be done about it, uh, they can march and whine and pray and put balloons on a fence and teddy Teddy bears bears. and all like that. They (laughs) might as well just go on and buy the whole warehouse full of teddy bears and balloons because we're going to keep doing it as long as we have the system of white supremacy. Now, eat that, Negro. We've got to understand that. We've got to understand what we're dealing with. Demonstrate if you want to. I'll let you do that. But I'm going to do the same thing a half a block away while you're demonstrating. And what are you going to do about that? Run down the street and demonstrate for that, too? I'll have you demonstrating all over the place. Keep demonstrating. Okay. But I'll do what I want to do as long as I want to do it because that's my agenda. Hmm. Okay. Um, before I go to Nathan, 
Mr. Fuller, you have repeated this repeatedly and at nauseum, but I'm going to ask this question that has been in the chat room. Matter of fact, you've answered the question during this whole program, but I'm going to repeat this so that the person who asked this question can understand this. And here's the question. It says, can you ask Mr. Fuller what people should do to solve the problems instead of complaining about them? Now, I'm going to use a bad word here. I'm going to assume that they're talking about the problem of racism. I'm going to assume that may not be, but I'm going to assume that. But if that is, it says, can you ask Mr. Fuller what people should do to solve problems? Okay, to solve problems instead of complaining about them. Okay, I get it. Well, that's why I wrote the textbook for victims of white supremacy, and that's why I have a program. Because I was at a meeting once. I'll just give this as an illustration. Uh, Back in the 1970s, I was in northeast Washington at a meeting, and uh, they were trying to get some businesses going for black people because they say we didn't have enough black businesses uh, anywhere, and black people need to go into business. So I was at the meeting. I was asked to attend. And at that meeting, someone pointed out, a person across the room, and someone said to me, you see that black guy over there? I said, yes. said, that black guy, that light-skinned black guy with the slick back hair. I said, yes, I see him. said, don't talk to him. I said, why? said, he's from the Justice Department. And I said, my response was, that's exactly who I want to talk to. Because I was just standing around not talking to anybody. So when he pointed that out, I said, that's who I want to talk to. Somebody who is about justice? Oh, yeah. You get plenty of talk out of me. I mean, I'm in an unjust system that I can't stand. Yeah. Somebody who's talking about justice? I want to talk to him. I don't care who it is. So I walked over and started talking to him. And I was telling him, you know, that I was... uh, I hadn't written a book yet. I had all the notes and whatnot. That was back in 1974, I believe. And and the, my book came out in 84, 10 years later, the original copy. And so we were talking. He immediately whipped out a pad and started writing. And so I was talking, and he was writing. And at a certain point in me talking about what I'd been working on and what my ideas were for producing justice, uh, he said, I got a question. I said, yes. He said, why are you doing what you are doing? And I said, what else do I have to do in life? I said, I'm a victim of white supremacy. And so I need to replace the system of white supremacy with a system of justice. And he looked at me and kind of blinked. And fell out laughing. He put his pad down and then picked it up again and started trying to write and fell out laughing again. Because I told him, what else do I have to do? What else am I supposed to be doing? I'm a victim of white supremacy in a system of white supremacy that denies me justice. So therefore, I'm supposed to be trying to replace that system with the system of justice. If I'm doing anything else... Like I say on the back of the textbook, I'm wasting my time that has been given to me. What produces time and what gave some of that time to me, my creator. And so that's what I'm saying now. I went along by way of of doing it to give that illustration. Every black person on this planet should have as his or her priority the replacement of the system of white supremacy with the system of justice using every ounce of strength and time that you have in doing so if you're allowed to do so and to the extent that you're doing so every day that you're on this planet. Why? Because it's the most logical thing that a black person can do. It doesn't get more logical than that. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. All righty. Let's do this. Let's go to Nathan in Spain. Uh, wait a minute, Nathan, see if I can get you in here. Thank you for your for calling way over in Spain. Go ahead, Nathan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, right now it's like uh, almost 5 o'clock in the evening. Clear skies. I'm on the beach right now. Um, what is your name, host, by the way? My name is Mr. Bobby. What's your question for Mr. Fuller, Nathan? All right, Mr. Bobby. All right, Mr. Fuller, according to what Mr. Bobby put out about can I can I ask Dr. Neely Fuller um, how to solve, you know, the injustices or whatever? No, I cannot ask you that. But I know that in your speaking, as I've been listening to you, um, you do put out great information. I appreciate it. Um, how can I say? I'm not going to linger too long uh, or anything, but thank you both for your work. Uh, I may contact you again in the near future. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All righty. Uh, thank you, um, Nathan from Spain. Uh, let's I appreciate see. his appreciation. Yes, yes. Let's go to, oh, I thought it was Sylvia. It is. Okay. Sylvia, let me see if I can get you in here. Thank you for holding. Uh, wait a minute. Sil- there we go. Sylvia, good morning. You can be heard. And what is your question for Mr. Fuller? Wait a minute. It just moved. Sylvia? Okay, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Let's see if we can get you in here. A little problems here. Sylvia? Is this Sylvia? Yes. Okay, uh, you have to speak up, dear. We can't hear you. Okay, speaking to the yeah, phone here. Go ahead. Talk- yes. I don't have a question. Okay, go ahead. I don't have a question. I oh, you don't have a question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It had your name up here. Okay. You're just listening. Okay, you you can do that. Thank you for uh, listening there. Okay. Uh, let's see who's on my screen here. Whoops. Don't want that. But while we're doing that, Mr. Fuller, um, Black Speak had this question here. It says, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Fuller, uh, what does the code say about removing Confederate statues from public display, and what of, what will be the effect of this practice? Well, I thought about it and thought about it, and I haven't really made up my mind whether to leave them where they are and then tell the true story of one of the statues, of what the statues are there for. The true story, which is to maintain white supremacy. Just say that on all those statues. And you can leave them there. Or you can put them somewhere else in one place and name the whole museum. These are tributes to white supremacy. Just like they have the Holocaust Museum. I mean, all about you know what happened to some people under religious persuasion. They have it right here in Washington, D.C., even though the what is called the Holocaust happened in a place that's distant from Washington, D.C. But I understand they have quite a few museums. So you can scout them all over the world if you want to. Robert E. Lee on his horse and say, now this statue was made in tribute to a person who was an excellent general, ex, uh, new excellent strategy, what not, General Robert E. Lee, and he was a slave owner, and uh, he believed in slavery. He believed in maintaining slavery. He was basically a white supremacist, and put that all over the statue to put it a statue and what not, and plaques and what not around the park where the statue is. Just name what everybody did. In other words use the vernacular that black people use, just tell it like it is. That's all. And let people use their own judgment. You know, well, is this somebody I should admire or not? He existed. Somebody thought enough of him to make a statue of him, but tell the truth about him. He just don't put it in there that, you know, 
date of birth and date of death, and he was a great general fighting for the cause and let it go at that. What cause? Go into some details around that statue. Have huge plaques, and if you use the term white supremacy, put it in big, bold letters so that we drive by. That's the thing that will stand out even more than the statue. White supremacists, another one of them. And you drive a block, another white supremacist. I mean, uh, Stonewall Jackson, Andrew Jackson, I mean, uh, uh, Kit Carson, I mean, you know, white supremacists. Cowboy. Uh, uh, who's this guy? Boy? Uh, the boy knife? Uh, Jim Bowie? Yeah, whomever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think he's in that category. If he believes in white supremacy, say that. I mean, General Sherman, I mean, say that that's what he is. Call it like it is. Just tell the truth. And let everybody just go from there. I mean, but don't say that, you know, if you're saying you're paying tribute to him and I'm a white supremacist, then say that. A white supremacist put it up, authorized it, a person that believed in what he believed in. But just tell the truth. Codification is about telling the truth, even when it hurts. Okay. All righty. All righty. Let's see here. Let's see if we can get you in here. Tell the truth. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to the two one three. Okay. Look like Swa, you're back on. Go ahead with your question. Hello, hello Swa. Oh, I'm here. Um, Mr. Newby Foy, can um, victims? of racism also be um, race soldiers? Because I'm quite confused about what do we call um, the victims of racism with the gun and the badge? No. That's Thank answer. you. That's why I invented that term, race soldier. A race soldier has to be uh, a white. Because a black person cannot be a racist in the system of white supremacy. That's why. So when I say race, black people are not even members of a race. We were told we were members of a race. Told by whom? The white supremacists. They invented that mess. They are members of a race and the only members. Race is racism. That's in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. When you say that you're a member of a race, that's what you're saying. You believe in racism. And what is racism? Mistreating people based on color. That's all it's good for. It's not good for nothing else. You can't name anything else that it's good for being a member of a race other than to practice racism. And racism means mistreatment by definition. That's what racism is based on color. So black people are victims of racism. So a law enforcement officer, that's what you call all of them because they're enforcing laws of some type, Mm -hmm. whether the laws are laws that should exist or shouldn't exist. But only a white person can be a race soldier, and a race soldier cannot be a police officer. That's what we. That's why that's in the textbook. To not confuse police officers with race soldiers. Mm-hmm. A race soldier is a racist pretending to be a police officer. It's impossible for a race soldier to be a police officer, even though you have many, 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 many imposters. Hmm. Yes. If a white man that's got on a uniform that says he's a police officer and he believes in practice and racism, he is a phony. He's a race soldier. He's an imposter. But you can't call him that because the white supremacists won't go along with it. So what do you do? 
According to the code, you call him suspected race soldier. And that's we should start using that term so that yes. we don't get com- them confused with police officers. There are many yes. people. A police officer, first of all, is what? Because I've been to police school. I went to police school in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, back in the 1980s. And uh, I didn't get a chance to answer a question that the instructor held up his hand because the instructor held up his hand. Uh, the instructor, rather, said, everybody, anybody who wants to answer this question can answer it. And he says, what's the first requirement of a police officer? What should be the first requirement? So I held up my hand, but he didn't call on me, so I never got a chance to say it. But what I was going to say, if he had called on me, was the first requirement to be a police officer is to have the correct intentions. Hmm. If you go in there with any intention other than producing justice, you ain't going to qualify to be a police officer. I don't care how many qualifications you've got on paper. Arrest mm-hmm. procedures, you know how to chase cars, you know how to do this and do that. If you go in there with the incorrect intentions, you should be disqualified right out of the gate. Mm. And if you have the intentions of doing anything racial, which means mistreating somebody based on color, you shouldn't even be allowed around a police station nowhere except as a prisoner. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> All righty. Thank you, Sue. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, Swa. Thank you. Uh, this is an, an anonymous question, Mr. Fuller, about money. It says, um, why is when a relative goes to jail or prison, their family is quick to support them by putting money on the books. But if they were going to college, they received no money from the family. Why is this type of behavior accepted in the black community? Because we go according to what we call black traditions. And black traditions are tailored to be supportive of what is already in place. That's why we still have it in place. That's why I wrote the textbook for victims of white supremacy. We need a new black culture from top to bottom. We need a new culture. We can't clean the one, clean up the one we got. We ought to start all over again from scratch, which means we got to have a culture that's designed to do what? Replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice and produce universal man and universal woman. That should be the definition of black culture. We have never had a black culture that could handle the job of handling the system of white supremacy. So everything in what we praise now is a part of black culture. is just as raggedy as it can be. So we, we need a culture that really works. And how do we do that? We've got to build a code. The white supremacists have a code. That's why they're successful. The one thing we don't have is a code that's designed to replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. And we can start doing that. I recommend, because this question has been asked on this program and on other programs, I would recommend... First of all, not just for Neely Fuller trying to sell books, which I am, because that's the only way I can sustain what I'm doing. That's a compensatory route. That's the only thing that's available to me is this program and the code books. So this is what I do to try to start us in that direction. I try to use the code that I have written myself. In fact, when I first started writing it, I was writing it for myself. And then people start noticing my behavior, both white people and black people, back in the 1950s. And they said, you know, Fuller, you got a peculiar way of going about doing everything. You know, there's something weird about you. You're a real weirdo, man. 
You know, mm. yeah, you know, I'm trying, I, I'm trying to understand you, but I can't, uh, I can't keep up with the way you, you, way you say things and the way you do things. And I had noticed it, but I was doing it out of frustration because I said I was a bundle of nerves. I was what you call, and I've told people this, man, I was a black Barney Fife, if ever there was one. Mm. If you're familiar with the character Barney Fife and Andy Griffin show. Andy Griffin, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man, uh, you're talking about fumbling and stumbling on everything. That was my characteristic. And I yes, said, sir. I'm tired of being that way. I got to know how to handle situations. So I started writing. So I started writing the first six pages of the code book for myself. And little by little, people started noticing my behavior was different because I would start following my own code. I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I ain't going to be involved in nothing that doesn't work for me. I got you. And everything that will work for me and nothing that will work against me, rather. Okay. I'm not going to involved in nothing that will work against me. No more. If I am I, aware of it. So I try to write that in a code book. So I recommend that. You can get right. it by going to producejustice.com. I'm not Very just trying good. to sell a book. I'm trying to promote a whole new way of a black culture. Okay. So the one that we are having now obviously ain't doing the job. Boy, you ain't never lied. Woo. Have mercy. Listen, Mr. Fuller, um, we got about a couple of minutes here. Um, when is the next time – oh, by the way, producejustice.com where you can go get the books, everybody. Um when is the next time you're going to be on the Carl Nelson show? Carl Nelson show, W-O-L. I don't know at this time. They will let me know on their time. That's the Carl Nelson show, 95.9 FM. And 1450. Uh, W-O-L radio, uh, Dr. Yeah. Kathy Hughes station, one mm-hmm. of them. And that will be the Carl Nelson show, and I uh, on those shows periodically. And I yes. post when I'm going to be on okay. as fast as I can. When I get that information, I immediately put it on the website, producejustice.com. Yeah, That's and the make Carl sure, Nelson show. Yeah, and could you make sure I get it? 9 FM. Yeah, and, and 1450 AM. Uh, in, and 1450 uh, AM. Yeah. Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Uh, ooh, there was something else I was going to – oh, okay, yeah. Okay, we got to uh, see exactly two minutes. So, Mr. Fuller, you got two minutes to – express whatever you uh, want to express. I want to make sure you got that time. Go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Yes. Now, watch for the new words that come up, or words that are not new but are emphasized, like infrastructure. And so when people use that term, ask them exactly what that means in practical terms to people who are classified as non-white in all nine areas of activity. And list the nines, or you can write them down or go to the code book and get them all through the book, because it's all through the book on every page, uh, the nine areas of activity. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And anybody who starts talking about helping black people's infrastructure Give us what the details are in that so-called infrastructure in all of those nine areas of activity so we'll know what we're going to get. Hmm. Words should have definitions. Hmm. And that's what I want to part with today. All right. Somebody came up with the use of the word infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. We want to know what that means in detail. And what we can get out of it. We've come to the conclusion of today's program. We're so happy that uh, you had a chance to listen. Pardon me, we made a few mistakes again, as usual, but we're trying to get better. But thank you for listening. Thank you for your calls. Thank you, Mr. Fuller, for answering the question and taking time with us. And we hope to do better next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. And thanks for everybody who is associated. 